Happy Stony Sunday! This is episode 249. I am live from Seattle, Washington, where I'm actually at my friend Hope in Seattle's house. So we have got a different background of sorts for today. But the show, as usual, is a question and answer show mostly focused on cannabis. But the questions do come from all of you. So you can submit them on stonysunday.com slash askstonysunday or on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook with the hashtag AskStonySunday, and then I can try and answer a question. The live chat is going on Periscope and YouTube, so if you guys are here and smoking, do say hi. I love to find your questions, and I'll also be searching the hashtag AskStonySunday right now on Twitter to see if anyone's asked any questions. Let's see. All Dan Danny Bongstone. Danny Bongstone asked on Twitter, "When do I think European countries? No, excuse me. Which European country do I think will legalize cannabis first? It's kind of a complicated question because there are European countries that already have legal tolerance and legal acceptance for cannabis, but it's not legally regulated and sold in the way that California and, or excuse me, Washington and Colorado have moved forward with." Amsterdam has a huge, rich history of being very cannabis friendly, very progressive with the laws. But in the last like three to five years, they've kind of rethought that approach and reconsidered whether they want to be a tourist destination for cannabis. And they've enacted some laws that made it more for residents only or just less of a hot spot for pot cannabis tourism. So there's definitely room for other countries to pop up. Pass this on over to you if you'd like it. No problem. I got this pre-roll yesterday actually from a Peace Oil staff member and he just was like, here's a pre-roll, bam. And I was selling his girlfriend a fish and it was like fish pre-roll, magic moment. It was awesome. <clears throat> Smoking nice. There may be a surprise guest for some point during the show, but with a live show, you never know and not really sure if everyone can show up in time or how it's going to be, but I just wanted to make sure we could get the Stony Sunday going on Sunday from Seattle live. I see Stony710 asking who my favorite glass artist may be. And I think it's going to be the same answer for strains and formed of smoking and all that, which is I, I don't want to pick a favorite at all. I'm inspired continuously by so many different styles of glass. I think a lot of you may think, like, I like KGB because the donuts, and of course, but I like donuts. That's, like, obvious. And Joe Peters makes amazing, like, reef glass themes, fish and coral reefs and sharks and amazing, amazing scenes. I don't know. There's just so many artists I would think of. So many. I'm saying Reef Life, and then the name is escaping me right now. Hanshaw, Jack Hanshaw. That's who is also incredibly skilled. Um, a lot of the pieces that I'm describing are really, like, not scientific style. They're just worked color. And that's fair to say I'm not a big scientific snob or a scientific, like, I don't know, I don't really have a lot of scientific glass knowledge, which kind of cracks me up because I would think of my boyfriend's glass style as definitely more scientific. He's more of like the fab eggs and the clegs and like, you know, just specific perk styles and the way it bubbles and it's very, very like intentional. Whereas the glass that I'm seeing is much more like, I want it to look a certain way and I want the colors to like feel and just match together. And I want it to maybe like, surprise you. I want it to be something that you're like, holy shit, that's glass. I didn't expect it in some way. So the scientific state is much more surprising in how it hits and how it feels, but it's it's not necessarily like what I am drawn to right away. But Nerd Glass kills it. I'm just going to shout out to Nerd Glass. How could I not mention like my favorite glass artist and not mention my boyfriend? I have two fab eggs. I have um, what is that? my little like bubbler thing? 
And I feel like there's a fourth that I'm forgetting that you guys, oh, my birthday piece, the birthday piece. I can't forget the birthday piece at all. I think I just saw a text message on Periscope. I'm going to double check just to see if that is my special guest. Oh, it's not the special guest. Okay. Well, back on Periscope. Sorry if I cut out real quick. Regular test texts get ignored for this hour. But I did see a question come up on Periscope about Hemfest, wondering how it was to smoke there. It's been kind of portrayed as a smoke-free event this year, which is hilarious. Hempfest is a smoke-free event. It's as smoke-free as this living room. Am I legally supposed to? Well, actually, I'm in a private residence, so I legally could be smoking here. But technically speaking, when I go to the events in California and we're outside and I'm passing a joint to someone without checking their ID, that's illegal. When I am getting free dabs at a booth, and yes, I have my medicating bracelet on, but they didn't verify me. I'm not in their patient system. They're just giving me dabs. That's technically illegal. So a lot of the fear that came around Hempfest and the new legislation and that suddenly smoking with your friends was going to be illegal in public. I find that to be like a lot of scary tactics and a lot of just kind of negative energy telling you don't get involved, don't pay attention, don't speak up because it's all bad and it's all going to just shut you down. And I think that's totally ridiculous. So people were smoking joints. I saw people carrying around bongs. I was taking dabs. Other people were taking dabs, obviously. I didn't bring a setup. So anything I smoked there was thanks to other people. There was nectar collectors, like... I would say the difference between this event and other events that are more smoke friendly is that the booths at this event weren't throwing out smoke and dabs. They weren't calling you over saying, we'll smoke you out, take a fat dab, anything like that. It was a lot more like just friends and smoke circles and you would just dip out behind a booth or by the water or something. So there's definitely smoking occurring. I totally, I get that it's glass and everything, but, or glass, excuse me. I get that it's illegal and everything, but that's been part of the point of Hempfest as well. It's a protestable. It's not just a party. It's not just a smoke sesh. It's a protestable, which means we're protesting something. And if this year it's the fact that it's supposed to be a smoke-free event, let's protest that. I think it went pretty well so far. I smoked Friday, I smoked Saturday, and today is Stony Sunday, so I will be doing my best to smoke as well today. Definitely. Joe A is an Australian reefer who is watching on YouTube. And Joe A identifies as having pretty bad uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and finds indica strains to be the most helpful, but it's not legal in Australia yet. They're making such big progress in Australia. It's kind of blowing me away and making me embarrassed for America. But Joe is wondering if I have any thoughts for him and his boyfriend or the two of them having to feel like felons just to cope and get their medicine. It's super unfortunate that the laws are slow to catch up to what we know to be true about cannabis. And when you find medical relief with cannabis, it's frustrating when you find out you don't have the legal protection or safety to actually enjoy it and feel better. But I do think it's important to stay informed about the plant and stay passionate, stay positive, know that you're doing the right thing and that you are, you're, you're like a freedom fighter. It's not just about getting stoned and trying to sneak away. It's about breaking the law that you know is unjust and not necessarily being proud to do it, but not being ashamed of it, I think is really what's most important. So yes, you may feel like a criminal, and yes, you are in fact a criminal in many ways, but you're a criminal on the right side of history and on the right side of the truth, and I don't think it's something that you need to be ashamed of. I don't think it's something that you need to, need to I don't know, carry that with you at all. There needs to be a shirt made that says, my mom knows I smoke pot. I think it's so important because hiding from your family is really what keeps you hiding on the inside. I wonder if our special guest is here or if it's, oh, she's here, I think. I think, I think my special guest is here and we're live. So maybe, I hope if you could. Um, okay, I might have to go off Periscope for just a sec because I'm gonna text the special guest. Can I say that you're headed out to meet her? Yeah. Okay. Special guest, you guys, do we have any guesses for who it might be? Yeah, yeah, it's her. 
I did not get a chance to see her yesterday at Hempfest, but last night we connected on Twitter, and I'm so excited. Special guest. Let's tap out this little joint. Woo woo! And let's load up a dab. Okay, let's see. We got some stuff from Freedom. I'm so excited. I feel kind of bad that we're like already filming when she shows up, but I had to go live at 12.30. Ah! Let me just throw concentrates at you. I've got green crack. I've got ash goo. I've got critical hog. And I've got a very special guest over here, Charlotte. <laughs> hey. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Awesome. We're way down here, really. Hey, guys. I'm so excited. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for making it over here. This is amazing. No, I heard you were in town, and I was like, we got to smoke. <laughs> she hit me up on Twitter last night. She's like, we have to smoke. And I was like, you have to come to my show. And I was if like, there's any yes. chance, I want it to happen. So this is so exciting. Awesome. Oh, I set down Periscope because I got too excited. I forgot about them. <laughs> we'll get Periscope back on here. Sorry, you guys. Um, but I am taking the questions live. Where'd they go? Right here. And y'all, look, someone guessed. Trixie knew it was going to be you. I Did asked you to guess. <laughs> Trixie K from the get-go. She's like, Charlotte, Charlotte. She Charlo. knew it. That's <laughs> awesome. If you guys aren't familiar with Charlotte, get out from the rock you're hiding under. You quit your job, was it last year or earlier this year? It was last year, right before the vote to legalize recreational marijuana in Alaska. So it was September 22nd. We're almost at the one-year anniversary wow. of Fuck It, I Quit. Congratulations. <laughs> Tell, can you give a brief synopsis? If you haven't seen the video... How did it go down? Well, um, that morning, I knew it was going to happen, but no one at the news team knew. I was a news anchor working in Anchorage, Alaska at the CBS affiliate. So um, I was the weed, I was on the weed beat doing all the reports about it. And I did a story about the Alaska Cannabis Club. And I interviewed one of the youngest members of the club who was battling testicular cancer at 21. Wow. And um, after I shared that story, I relate to the audience, well, everything you just heard is why I, the actual owner of the Alaska Cannabis Club, um, am quitting or something? Yeah. <laughs> Fuck it, I quit. Fuck it, I quit. It was awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> oh, not that I have a choice, but um, fuck it, I quit. So. Yeah, and when you say you didn't have a choice, you meant that your, your interest in your your talents are really being divided because you couldn't give your whole heart to fighting for legalization and fighting for access right. and being a balanced and fair news reporter because exactly. you're going to have to be on both sides kind of. Is that what was going on? Exactly. You know, when you become a journalist, you have to um, have this certain level of integrity. And part of that is not inserting yourself into different, I guess, political things that are happening. You just have to stay neutral. You can't have a say in anything you can't even advocate for it in your personal time publicly oh wow so here i was i'm meeting the patients that are dying in alaska and i know that the story isn't being told fairly because the no side is just throwing out all of the same prohibitionist lies that they've been using for years and years and in tv news you have to give them at least one sound bite mm -hmm. even if it is and it, it just wasn't fair and i had to do something about it so I you just, have to be true to yourself. I had to. I love to that. myself, to um, to the cause, to the greater good. I love it. I was really amazed when I saw that clip because I had no idea that dispensary owners had other jobs. Mm -hmm. Like I honestly hadn't thought about it. And all of the people that are in different positions throughout our community, and they're also moonlighting as dispensary owners, mm -hmm. and they aren't able to talk about it. They aren't able to really be the advocate they want. Right. And they are opening safe access points. They're they're creating incredible helpful points in the community but they're still being silenced because they have another job they have to care for another responsibility they're still afraid to put at risk right yesterday um i spoke on a panel at hemp fest called cannabigotry we legalized it why are we still fighting and something we discussed was the fact that i mean here i was i wouldn't have been able to keep my job as a news anchor, even if we had legalized it just because of company policy and that that's just how it is. And then Sid Moore, I think is her last name, um, the news anchor that was just fired because she tested positive for THC in her system. She was on the panel too. And so it's like, even though you're showing yourself to be a responsible cannabis user, you are still being cast in the light of, well, there's no way you could do your job efficiently enough. So we're going to take that away from you if we find out. And how unfair wow. is that? 
I hadn't even heard Sid's story yet, so I'm glad that you brought it to my yes. attention. I missed that for whatever reason. There's but so much going on in cannabis culture. Reporters now. Yeah, well, she like, like, wait, what is it? It's like company policy and news when you're driving a company vehicle. Oh, okay. So if you get in any accident, you're drug tested on the spot. And so because she had just THC in her system, not that she was high driving, but you know, it sticks around for weeks. I'm dealing with the consequences of that because I went to Australia in May. I what? Yeah, they just amazing. take your, your blood on the and side then of the road. They take your spit. They do a saliva test. So I just pull you was over. flagged at a at a drug testing stop because it was right outside of a weed festival. So it's expensive to do the drug testing on the side of the road. They only do it outside of like festivals. When or, they know they're gonna get their money's yeah, worth. Yeah, exactly. So I got flagged down. I I was scared. I couldn't pull myself over. Like they didn't have lights on or anything. They just kind of like waved to me, and I was like, well, I don't know what to do. Pulled over. They did a spit test. I didn't say anything. I'm just waiting. He's like, okay, well, it's positive for cannabis. At this point, I say I'm a patient in California. I've only been here four days. I'm positive. It would be positive for my medicine at home. I don't have anything on me. Like, I know that it's positive. What What do we do now? Right. And he said, well, I have to do a secondary test because the first one is just roadside. So I had to go to his van, do a secondary test that lasted about 20 minutes, collected more saliva. It was really weird. I can imagine. <laughs> they run, like, the test is in your mouth for like 20 minutes. He said it was going to take 20 minutes, but I thought that meant to, like, process. But I was actually sitting there with, like, a Q-tip in my mouth for, like, 20 minutes. That's really weird. Then they process it at an actual laboratory, which is how they call it in Australia. It's so cute. <laughs> so then I came home. They told me I couldn't drive for 24 hours. I had my assistant and friend with me that they didn't test her at all. So she took over driving. And then weeks later, I'm now dealing with, like, a, maybe a Skype court date with Australia. To defend the fact that, yeah, cannabis stays in your system for nearly a month. I'm not inebriated or inhibited driving, but I will test positive. It's bizarre. So they seem to be open to the argument, but not quite. It's not legal. You it's have just to go open. through the process of the court. That is insane. And they watched it, too. I was actually filming when it happened. It Good. Was so it was so weird. And the officer that did it was, like, as kind as he could be, and he actually, like, asked me what I use cannabis for, and he was like, does it really help you? And I was like, I'm, I'm in love with it. You were educated. Yeah. That's so awesome. And he was receptive. Good. It was incredible. But just the gray area of we're testing positive, and you're not supposed to test, you're not supposed to drive if you are under the influence or um, impaired. That's the word I love to use. I saw that all right. over Hemfest. Don't drive impaired. I think that's perfectly accurate. Exactly. And just because you test positive for cannabinoids in your blood, has no link to impairment from the studies that are actually been done. Absolutely not. In fact, studies show it wears off after a few hours. And it's Whereas you can stuff. wake up drunk the next morning. Oh and that stuff, I mean, think comparing it to alcohol, it's just like, you wouldn't get fired for, for, I mean, do they even test for alcohol at work? I haven't heard of any. I've never heard of that either. Yeah. I, I just, it's just. So even weird. if you are driving a company car or something, it wouldn't. Until there's no. an accident. Exactly. Exactly. What do you notice is like a difference with talking about cannabis in Alaska and talking about cannabis in the states down here? Like, is it is it a conversation that's happening up there, or is it still maybe more small town esque? I've never been. I have no idea. Well, it can be really small towny, but in Alaska, we've been really progressive. Like, we are all about you know getting out there. It's the last frontier. We stake out our land. We want what's ours. We want our rights. And we want our privacy. So it's actually written into the Alaska State Constitution that we are allowed to possess up to four ounces of cannabis in our homes and grow up to 24 cannabis plants. If I remember a little bit of cannabis history, right, I think you guys did it either the same year as California or like moments before. Um, it's like 1996 that you guys like had something. Well, 98 was when we legalized medical marijuana, but this is back in 1972. Oh, what? This lawyer, um, he wanted to challenge the state's stance on privacy and marijuana, so he put a bunch of pot in his trunk, he went speeding down a highway, and then he defended himself. You know, if it's, if <laughs> we say that, that? Um, his name was Erwin Raven. I met his wow. daughter, and she is badass. So it's <laughs> yes, it's, but yeah, we have people like this that have been fighting for so long that I guess me and you are honored to, to yeah, just keep charging forward with, definitely. you know, always paying tribute to who carved out the tear. Like, that's a gutsy thing to do, but that's why we've had that open 
open stance on marijuana, which is why we have like the highest usage rate in the nation and why it made so much sense for us to finally legalize it yeah. last year. You know, I honestly forget that Alaska is legalized because I am, it doesn't seem as relevant to me. I haven't had a chance to go there. I don't hear from a lot of Alaskan reefers. So if you're out there, speak up. I want to know what's going on because I do constantly forget that legalization has passed. It's available. I need to make a trip. You need to come to me. Awesome. I'll take good care of you. Oh, yeah. I was talking to an Uber driver here that works half the time in Alaska, half the time here. Oh, yeah? And he was saying that everyone in Alaska is just, like, friendly and nice. And he was having a great time. He was telling me to go up there, too. So yeah. maybe it's going to happen. <laughs> do you dab? Of course I dab. Just making sure. Just making no, sure we're no. all. Dabbing is relatively, like... <laughs> We get things a little later in Alaska, so dabbing is a newer thing. Like, I'm usually introducing all of our club members. We have tons and tons, more than, I think, 1,500 at this point, club members. But I'm usually honored to give them their first dab whenever they join the Alaska Cannabis Club. Oh, so wow. we need to give you this dab. Oh, and this hopefully from. heat us up, because her torch is tricky, and I've given up my oh. use torch <laughs> over here. The dabs actually were given to me at Hemp Fest by Sweet Green Beds, I think it was. I tagged them on Instagram, but some of the best shadow that I've seen here in the Seattle area. Um, and I know concentrates and edibles, it's all, we also have concentrates and edibles for recreational. That is a still medical marijuana object or? Here? Yeah. Really? Yeah, recreational. So people that have been getting really good at doing extracts, their market just got cut basically because they're not supposed to do it for recreational, it's only for medical. So the person that gave me this, they're like trying to find the recreational card to give me, and they only have their medical, and they're like, I can't give you the medical cards. I I don't live here. I can't go into a dispensary. So it's it's kind of confusing to me that like there's so crazy. There's good quality shatter here, but it's not actually for everyone. Hmm. <laughs> and so yeah, the recreational access you you don't have full access. And I haven't gone into a shop yet. Have you while you've been here? Um, no. No, I guess I, wait, we're slacking. I feel like so it means we're spoiled and we're lazy, like at the same time. Like, we're well taken care of, we have friends here, we haven't had to go into a dispensary, but at the same time, I haven't heard from a lot of locals that dispensaries are amazing and worth going into, the legal ones at least. I've heard a lot of them sell out. They don't have very much available. It's really, really good. It's good stuff. They call yeah. it Santa Muerta or death oil, but there's no death involved as far as I know. It tastes good. I don't get it. What death oil? Why? I know a lot of these names are kind of are kind of like why, you know? <laughs> there's one dispensary in San Francisco that I know of that changes Agent Orange and AK-47 to less war-related names mm. because some of their veterans have expressed like just being uncomfortable with seeing that on the menu. I don't want to buy Agent Orange. I don't want to buy an AK-47 strain. Right. And I think that's really cool. Like they try and name it something that's not trigger heavy really but then it's kind of confusing the genetics how are we tracking this that's my thing with it because people need to be able to look it up and know what they're getting especially if they're trying to use it to treat something and to really? be consistent with it here's a stony sunday question for everyone that i am still trying to wrap my mind around have you read the reclassification of sativa and indica in ruderalis no <laughs> this, okay, so I'm going to very vaguely try and explain. Someone explain it to me. Indicas are actually called Afghanicas. Sativas that we know are actually Indicas. And Ruderalis is actually Sativa. And it's not a separate plant. It's actually the same, just... Yeah. I don't know. I've read this Who's report. This? It came out in 2014. Um, Earl Ripper from... Um, oh my god, I'm going to think of it. Just a steep hill, I think. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's only like the third time I mentioned it because I'm still trying to work my brain around. <coughs> but they're basically <coughs> basically saying that <coughs> we thought Ruderalis was more of a separate, separate plant. You right. know, it's its own um, genus. But in reality, what we think of as Ruderalis is actually a descendant of sativas. And what we know is sativas are actually descendants of indicas because they come from the Kush Mountains, and it all goes back to like the land race and the okay. origins. Okay. 
And when we actually look at the origin of the strains, according to this paper that came out, that again, I'm still trying to figure out how this makes sense. And it's saying we've had it wrong all along. Yeah. So we've just, we mislabeled it and then we kind of ran with it and we started writing books about it and papers and right. doing everything, right. but we've been confused. So are there <coughs> any strains that are like Bluteralis that we're smoking that we know of? that might be offering that different effect and maybe now we know why or like I don't know. maybe we can do trial runs with this like maybe it is jeremy, an indica or sativa i think his name is jeremy huh some short last name uh, he used to work for cannabis now he's an author he was telling me on friday that what we think of is ruderalis across the united states and the ditch weed um we think of it as like hemp and not very valuable mm -hmm. it's actually from the victory for hemp grow projects and it's actually like really thick sativa stocks and so he was saying that there's all this weed across the united states that we think of as like low quality useless weed but it's actually like descendants of what we planted and grew for the victory for hemp project i don't know i'm i'm still trying to figure this out so. i want to hear about this victory for hemp project yeah when the united states required farmers to grow hemp oh yeah way back when way back when, way back the when. Days. yeah so then all the ditch weed that's now is because they started growing hemp mm -hmm. then that project was either cut or my history is a little rough but it ended before harvest and so there were a lot of farmers that just left their crops they just stopped tending to them because it cost more to go clean them up it cost more to continue right. on if there was no guaranteed buyer for it <coughs> so now there's just ditch weeds it's actually valuable sativa descendants i don't know i've been learning and trying to soak up a lot at him fast there's so much <coughs> knowledge it's like constantly to the point it's like my brain has to be getting big. like my head looks larger now it's you leave Hempfest a little, a little smarter, maybe. <laughs> yeah, a lot smarter. <laughs> I love that because Hempfest really puts a focus on the speakers. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you were on a panel. Yeah. There's panels all day. There's either three or five stages with speakers. Right. It's more music heavy after like 5 and 6 p.m., but during the day, you have a chance to hear from people from all different parts of the industry and community. Yeah, there are tons and tons of speakers. I'm going to be speaking again at 3.45 and... 440 or something? Something 45. like that. 445. 345 and 445. Yeah. What stages? Do you know what stages? Um, I don't. Yesterday was the main stage. Oh, nice. So that was, that was, it was fun. It was good. Yeah. yeah I was super anxious. Oh, How is this going to be received? Ooh, main stage again. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's awesome that you're getting out there and getting your message out there because as a woman, it seems like there's not a lot of peers that are doing it independently. There's a lot of really strong partnerships and a lot of um, like couples that are out there and, and the woman is an equal and she's also doing badass things. But to just the woman's name first or mm -hmm. the woman's name and that's it, I think is incredibly valuable. And it's awesome to just have more and more peers showing that like there's room for everyone. We can all get out here and speak our minds and really share our story with cannabis and why it matters. Absolutely. In fact, what I was doing yesterday was introducing the evolution of Fuck It, I Quit, which is um, our nonprofit organization, Go Green, with an E at the end, like Charlo Green, which stands for Grassroots Evolution Through Education, Networking, and Empowerment. And what we are doing is growing a network of different formal and informal groups across the nation and wherever anyone wants to start one, where we just encourage community and conversation. I love that. You that's know, great. That's yeah. that's where it has to start, and then start taking action. We we plan on giving everyone the tools they need to become champions of the movement in their Good. own area. So yeah. gogreen.org, um, check us out. But exactly, everyone needs to feel like they have the right to speak and share their story, and that's the only way we're going to normalize this and get past prohibition. Yeah, absolutely. Normalizing it is going to be the biggest value. And we don't need to be like Fox or I'm going to just say other political parties where they want uneducated, mindless people voting for them because they just want the numbers. We want educated people out there. We want people that know what's going on with cannabis because you really have to be the active. middle point and active right. it. And, and yeah, and not, not everyone gets there by yourself. Exactly. Not everyone's going to read everything. But if the few of us are willing to make the sacrifice in terms of time and energy so we can translate the message. Like you educating that cop, I'm sure he went and told someone about what he learned. It Seriously. Was it was so weird. It yeah. was weird, but he was asking you questions and yeah. I'm sure soaking up like, yeah, she's from America and this is how they do it over there. Maybe someone in his life 
uh, you know, suffers from bipolar disorder or depression or anxiety because he, he like fully was asking very interesting questions See? about it. It was really interesting. You know, just take every opportunity to share your truth. Like all of us are so diverse. Whatever your truth is, it's going to be a value in this conversation. Absolutely. I'm so glad you could be on the show this week. I'm glad to be awesome. here. <laughs> we'll see maybe two more questions, two quick questions from the live stream. We have Periscope and YouTube going. Theo's been asking a couple of times over if there's any good bong water replacements. And I, I have nothing. Bong water replacements? Fresh oh. water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Switch fresh, it out. Fresh water. Uh, yeah, I'm seconding that. Yeah. Have you ever <laughs> smoked with like like lemonade or anything weird in the water? I yeah yeah I got a bunch of mold in my body no. because of it. Yeah, I tried like Kool Aid. I tried, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, put like juice. It was like ooh, this is kind of cool. Put juice in there. Fun. It was not a good idea. Just fresh water. We did lemonade best water. and then we like poured it out and threw it in the back of my car. And I remember not mold, but just like sticky nastiness later when I went to pick it up. Being like, I don't ever want to smoke out of this again it's just not so water is good water seems to work i enjoy it i enjoy it a lot and are there any more questions or is this it this is it oh wait do we plan oh well the first question was answered earlier um if you planned on quitting or if it was spontaneous but you said you knew this was yeah, a plan i knew i knew as soon as the company went live and we saw how needed the service was i made the choice and so it was all kind of planned out from there and you've been kicking us since then. So thank you very much for being on the show, Shiloh. Thank have you for it. having me. We're going to go enjoy Hempfest, and you're going to be speaking later today. So if you guys are there, definitely go catch her on the main stage. Mm -hmm. And I'll be cruising aimlessly. So if you see me, just wave or something. I'll just be cruising. Absolutely. Stay high, you guys. Bye, guys.